so I'd like to tell you about uh, two pieces of work that my lab has done. Um, this this is probably one of the few, the first times, not the first, but one of the first times um, I've described both uh, both themes. Um, and um, it can run a little bit long, so I've shortened it down. But if I gloss over anything, you know, and it leaves you confused, please don't, you know, don't uh, hesitate to say something. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions during the talk as well. Don't feel like you got to wait to the end or anything. I'm always happy to make it interactive, especially if it's a, a question you think is going to help everybody else understand what's going on. Uh, I have no, uh, no, uh, no ego about that whatsoever. So um, first of all, I'm going to try and define these two terms. Biomining right here, um, that's using microbes to get metals, especially for sustainable energy technologies. Um, and electromicrobial production. This is a fairly, you know, I, when, I was, when I made that joke about so not knowing what I call my work, electromicrobial production is the best word I have come up with that can satisfy any reviewer uh, and that offends no one, but it's not the most lovely term. And basically, it means process, any process. That's why we had to come up with a new term. Any process where a microbe can absorb electricity into its metabolism and then use it to assimilate or fix very simple carbon containing molecules. For instance, um, could be CO2, but it could also be electrochemically reduced CO2 products like formic acid, methanol, uh, carbon monoxide, you name it. And then make out of that, out of those two things, electricity and the carbon make something useful, typically a commodity chemical or some sort of value added chemical. Um, I always do my intro as well first. I really like introing people because um, I often get, you know, I often over speak and run out of time at the end. And I, I always, I think if I did that, I would, you know, if I would put this at the end, I would do a disservice to all the folks who have helped me out over the years uh, and would not be here talking to you today if it were not for their help. The most, hello, thank you for coming but thank you for coming uh thank you for coming um so the you know the people we're really going to highlight today are um uh, and i'm going to use this pointer and it's very clever supposedly and it will show up in teams as well oh well it was supposed to show up in teams so that the people you should really you should really um you should really be um <gasps> that's why it's not doing it okay so now the people you should be thinking about are uh, Farshid Salimajazi up here, who's uh, led all of our work on electromicrobial production. Jaywan Kim too, as well. Um, Alexa Schmitz, you'll hear a bit more about Alexa, maybe in a video later on. She's my first postdoc and, and sort of trained up my lab actually, um, and now runs a company based on our work. Um, Brooke Pian, uh has run my lab for five years um, and I would not be, definitely wouldn't be here without her. Uh, Sean Medine, a grad student, co-founder of Regen, a company based on our work, and Esteban Gotzel, who is a, a longtime collaborator and friend uh, and geochemist. Again, we would not really have made nearly as much progress uh, in electro in biomining without him. Um, so, uh, again, before I get too far into this, um, I'd like to sort of step out. You know, I'd really like to spell out the sort of animating goals of my lab. Um, so, you know, almost 90 years ago, Sir Alexander Fleming, um, you know, who this building is named after, uh, discovered antibiotics. Uh, and he sort of set the stage for a revolution in medicine by applied biology. And that's continued, you know, that revolutionized the world and continues to revolutionize the world from, the, from antibiotics, vaccines, recombinant protein drugs, now things like mRNA vaccines, CRISPR editing of genomes. Um, biology, now that's a great example of the power of applied biology. Biology doesn't just work at the human scale, the small organismic scale. It works at the global scale as well. And if you add up the, con the, photosynth the photosynthetic power of all the plants, all the algae on the surface of the earth, they can capture solar energy at a rate of about 120 terawatts. Um, that's six times current world power usage. And, and so we think this gives us an existence proof. Um, and my, my interest in this really started, I would say, in this building when I was an undergrad here at Imperial. We think that over the next 80 years, 90 years, 
applied biology is going to help us build a revolutionary new sustainable energy infrastructure. I don't know. I want to stress, I don't think that biology is going to let us solve every problem in sustainable energy. I'd be shocked if we were to come to the end of the century and have every technology for energy built around biology. But I would be equally shocked if a few of them weren't as well. I think I think biology, I, I think this is an often underlooked asset of biology. I think it could have an incredible, incredible impact on our system, on our attempt to build a sustainable energy future. Um, next, I love to set the stage for this problem as well. The, the energy problem is truly enormous. Um, and I, as a physicist, I really love to do back of the envelope mathematics. Um, so by the end of the century, about uh, there'll be about 11 billion people alive. I'm, I'm hoping to be one of them. I'm sure some of you do too, and I'm sure some of you will be one of them. Um, I don't think the solution to the climate and energy problem is um, is energy austerity, right? I don't think that we can we can sort of solve it by taking less showers, unplugging the plugs, and turning them off. Like I, I don't think that energy I think energy efficiency definitely has a role. Absolutely, it does. But I don't think it's the only solution. I think it's only a small tool in the toolbox for solving the climate problem. The reason I think this is I don't think we can deny human aspiration for a better life. And we know if you if you look at across human history over the past, you know, the past 10,000 years, you'll find that quality of life correlates extremely well with energy use per capita. If we want to build a happier, better world by the end of the century, people are going to be using a lot more energy. And, and I think that we I, I, I'm fairly confident that everybody alive today who you know isn't a, an American or a European wants to live like an American or a European does today. And that means it will come with the same amount of power usage. So let's take the 11 billion people and give them the power usage that an American a European uses about a half of this. So we take 11 billion people by 10 kilowatts per person. Multiply those two numbers together and we get 110 terawatts. That's about the amount of power that the global biosphere uses. Six times world power usage. So this tells you two things. Uh, well, it actually tells you three things. One is that humanity, if it isn't also already, will become a force of nature, I think, by the end of the century. And we've got to figure out environmentally friendly ways to allow that to happen without despoil. We we can't sort of despoil the world as we try to save it from climate change. The second thing is, it means we're going to have to rebuild the energy infrastructure that we have today. The one that we built over our, you know, human civilization built over the past 150 years since the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania. Then, so we're going to have to build it once over again by 2050 to not cook the planet with global warming to go net zero. And then by the end of the century, we're going to have to build it four or five times over again to meet growing the growing aspirations of the global middle class um, of a global middle class. And what I take from this is, OK, this sounds scary, right? Sounds like a scary challenge. It's enormous. It's the biggest engineering feat that human civilization has ever will ever have to pull off, basically, or has ever pulled off. But it also means there's loads to play for as well. There's loads of opportunity here to create new technologies to meet this demand, uh, to solve the environmental problems with expanding energy use. So we shouldn't handicap ourselves by short term thinking. We should think ambitiously about what biology, synthetic biology in particular, can do, can do to help solve this energy problem. Um, why do I think this? So. Uh, a few years back, Jose Avalos and I, a friend at, at Princeton, came up with a, a list of all the problems where we think we can apply biology um, to sustainable energy. We built this Venn diagram that sort of describes what we think biology is, basically. Um, so it's uh, all about room temperature and room pressure catalysis and self-assembly. And those two features really sort of create all the other wonderful features of biology, like self repair and replication, CO2 fixation, redox, very the ability to catalyze incredibly difficult redox transformations, and then the synthesis of materials with amazing rheological properties. 
Now, but, but we've got all these amazing capabilities in biology's toolbox, but there are very, very few microbes out there that exactly fit the bill for any application in sustainable energy. So I can think of only one really, Acidothiobacillus ferrooxidans. Uh, this is a, an acid loving microbe uh, that supplies about 20% of the world's copper supply and about 5% of the world's gold supply. But it's unique in that it does this amazing task that's vitally important for the global economy. It's the only one I can think of that doesn't need engineering, that does it right out of the bar. Uh, so what that means is that if we are going to deploy engineered, I, and, I would, I, and I, I, maybe I'm short-sighted in this, but I think, I think engineered microbes to solve problems in energy, we're going to have to build them by synthetic biology. And then we're, we're really in luck. So thanks to people in this room, in fact, and thanks to the global scientific community, we've got advanced tools for reading, writing, and editing genomes. But we know very little about this, the weirdest microbes that offer the most amazing capabilities to synthetic biology. If you think about it, most of biology over the past 50 years, certainly since the 1970s and the start of the war on cancer uh, in the United States, we focused most of our efforts, I would argue, uh, certainly most of our money on, st on studying a small handful of biomedically relevant model organisms. Uh, no problem at all. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, a small number of biomedically relevant model organisms. Uh, and I can name them. I, I can name them probably on the fingers of one hand. You've all heard of them. E. coli, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, C. elegans, uh, zebrafish. And I'm already, I'm already blanking on the fifth finger. Uh, I could probably I could probably fill up this hand if you were to give me a little bit extra time. Uh, but what that means is we've we've really left, we've really ignored all this amazing potential of biology in the weird books. Um, and as a result of this, uh, you know, we've developed amazing genetic tools for those four or five, maybe a dozen biomedically relevant bugs. But all the others we've we've ignored. And what this means is even though the cost of sequencing a genome has dropped dramatically since the turn of the century, it's gone from millions of dollars to uh, sequence a human or a microbe. And now it costs you pennies potentially to do it with next generation sequencing. You still, we still have not much of a better idea what 30 to 40 percent of the coding sequences in that genome do. Most of them are annotated as proteins of unknown function. And we think most of the amazing capabilities of biology for energy are in that sort of, I, you, some people might call it dark matter of the genome. So what this means is we've got to figure out new ways, cheaper ways, faster ways to understand what genomes are doing so that we can engineer them for sustainable energy applications. Um, especially right now, where most scientific funding is still focused towards biomedical problems. I hope it won't be that always, but right now we have to figure out a way to think cheap and think fast as well. Uh, and I'm going to give you two examples of this methodology that we've applied to biomining and then to electromicrobial production. Um, so let's come back to this sustainable energy infrastructure that I've been talking about. This thing that's going to power the planet totally net zero. It's going to give 11 billion people an amazing quality of life. It's going to have a stupendous appetite for metals, we think. so. Rare earth elements, this will be the, the main focus of my talk. These are found in things like high field magnets, battery anodes, high efficiency lighting, high temperature superconductors, high strength lightweight alloys, nuclear power, advanced weapons too. And this is kind of what, get, this is I think where we've been very lucky over the past few years. There's been amazing bipartisan agreement in the United States about the need to tackle this problem. Um, it's the uh, International Energy Agency predicts demand for rare earths is going to grow sevenfold over the next 20 years. Uh, the situation for nickel, which is used to make catalysts uh, for things like hydrogen production, that situation is even more challenging. I wouldn't say bleak, it's just a challenge. Uh, demand there is going to grow 19-fold. Uh, cobalt batteries, uh, demand will skyrocket by 21-fold. The platinum group elements uh, there, Things like production of hydrogen, solar PV, high voltage direct current transmission, 
We don't know where the demand is going to go for that. Uh, research, you know, my home university at Cornell here at Imperial is trying to find better ways to do electrocatalysis without platinum group elements. If those, if those efforts pay off, and I hope they do, the demand for PGE might stay flat. Those efforts may not pay off in time, though. I don't think we can bank on it. So again, demand for platinum group elements could also skyrocket over the next 20 years. Finally, I did a little back of the back of the napkin maths uh, before I came here. Um, magnesium, this is one that's dear to my heart. So over the, if we were to do nothing about the climate change problem and say human civilization were to stop, even if you know human civilization were to burn all the fossil fuels in the ground, the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere would eventually come back to its baseline of around 280 parts per million. Thanks to a process called uh, uh, weathering and carbon mineralization uh, that draws carbon out of the atmosphere over the course of a few tens of thousands of years. This process has regulated the Earth's climate, you know, really over the entire course of its history. Uh, it'll deal with the carbon dioxide problem in 10,000 years, but we've only got 100 years really to deal with it. Can we accelerate this process? If we can increase the dissolution rate of ultramafic rocks to release something like magnesium and iron, we'll be able to sequester all the excess CO2 in the atmosphere. What this means, though, is that global demand for magnesium will go up 6,000 fold over uh, over 2020 uh, demand. Somehow we've got to figure out how to make 6,000 fold increase in the world's magnesium supply. Uh, and I think biology can help us do all of these things. As I mentioned um, earlier on in my talk, Acidothiobacillus ferrooxidans already supplies 20% of the world's copper supply. And it does this from very low grade, very low grade ores. And we think that the future of mining, think about the reason that cobalt, for instance, is so politically contentious. It's because the highest grade ores for cobalt are found in authoritarian nations. And it just happens to be a quirk of the geology of those nations. But these elements are all over the world in low grade deposits. If we can figure out how to mine low grade deposits, we can we can meet all these demands. Uh, and biology has already figured out, at least with copper mining and acidothiobacillus, how to do that. So it gives us an existence proof. This lecture is really going to focus on the rare earths. Though. So the rare earths are, and I want to introduce their chemistry as well as their applications. If you look in the periodic table in column three, you'll see two elements, scandium and yttrium. These are typically, these are often called rare earths. Um, we use them in high strength, lightweight alloys, superconductors. If you look below, a row below, you'll see a missing, missing sort of box. It's not there's a missing element. There's actually 14 of them, the lanthanide series. These are, when I say rare earths, I really typically mean lanthanides. Um, now, they aren't all that rare, as I just said. They're very, you know, they're they're a thousand times, I think, more rare than, say, the transition, the most common transition metals like iron. But they're about a million times more abundant than the platinum group elements. The only problem is they're diffuse. You never find them in concentrated deposits. So what that means is in order in order to in order to mine them, you have to excavate enormous amounts of rock which in itself poses an enormous environmental challenge. The second challenge is they just fit into one box on the periodic table. They're highly chemically similar. So this the maximum difference in ionic radius is only 0.17 angstroms. Um, and what this means is the separation of individual lanthanides, you can't use them as a mixture in high tech applications, makes it one of the hardest problems in chemistry. Um, and to our knowledge, there are no known environmentally friendly molecules or substances that have a high selectivity for adjacent lanthanides. And they, this might be very, very difficult to make. So what it means is we have to we have to use we have to find the best small difference in affinity we can find and then amplify this by repeated enrichment. This in itself creates enormous operating challenges and environmental challenges as well. What we think is rare earth is by Biomining could replace the most horrible steps in rare earth biomining. Uh, so 
a thing I want to also stress to you is the strict environmental regulations, and I'm glad they exist, right? You know, and I, and, I'm, and, and, I, and I don't want them to go away. In fact, I would like to see them spread around the world. The strict environmental regulations prevent much mining and certainly separation of individual rare earth elements in the US. Up until about the, 90, the late 1980s, the, the US was the world's dominant supplier of rare earths from the mountain path mine. That operation was largely shut down due to the efforts of the Environmental Protection Agency. I don't think this is a bad thing in of itself. What happened though, was all of that production was shifted to China. And this creates enormous geopolitical risk for the US and also for many other Western nations as well. Um, so what this means is we need a process that we can operate in the US, but also we'd like to be able to operate all around the world as well. We don't want to solve our, uh, we don't want to solve our environmental problems, the climate change problem, by creating new environmental problems, new local environmental problems in developing countries other than China. We want to create a process that's good enough to operate in the Western world. Uh, so here it is. So we've got two processes on the left hand side of the screen right here. We've got the traditional thermochemical process it involves high temperatures, harsh acids, and then here, this is the step where we get rare, we get mixed rare earths out of rock, this thermochemical cracking process. Down here, we use a, an organic solvent extraction and organophosphorus based extractant molecules. We use them, we use them to ex, uh, separate individual rare earths. Uh, these two processes, like I said, horrible. We want to replace them with two other processes. So on here, bio leaching, where we use something called a biolixivient, a microbially made cocktail of compounds that can dissolve rock. And then in our second step, we use a process called biosorption and desorption, or at least we're planning on biosorption and desorption to separate individual rare earths. And that allows us to make individual high purity rare earth solutions that we can send off to be used in things like wind turbines, electric vehicles, batteries, superconductors, you name it. Um, so a few years ago, uh, we, we sort of set ourselves the goal of building two classes of microbes to solve this problem, to facilitate those two steps in the rare earth biomining process. Uh, the first one, the bio leaching, um, this is, um, we wanted to use a bug called Gluconobacter oxidans, and this has got a nascent capability for rare earth bio leaching. It was already pretty good at it. Shewinella onodensis. This also, for those of you who work on microbial fuel cells, you might have heard of this bug. And this is where my interest in it started with its electroactivity. We later discovered it's also got nascent capability for selective biosorption of rare earths as well. Uh, but then this is the crucial thing. These two nascent capabilities aren't quite good enough yet for industrial use. So what that meant is, we have to engineer these capabilities to improve them. And we hypothesized that if we could understand the regulation, we could understand the genetics of both of these processes, we can improve upon them by changing the regulation of endogenous genes. So our first goal is a better Gluconobacter oxidans, one that's able to bioleach more effectively than the wild type. And we set ourselves the goal of improving that somewhere between 50 and 90%. And then our second goal is to build a set of strains of Shewinella onodensis, each one of which is tailored to separate individual lanthanide elements. Now to do this, David, you might remember this. I quickly realized that this understanding the genetics of these two processes completely sucks. If we were to use classical classical genetics to do it, uh, you would go, I found myself going completely insane. So I said, gosh, well, somewhere, somewhere in the dark of night, I said, gosh, you know, I wish I had to understand the genetics of them. I said, I wish I had whole genome knockout collection for, for Shewinella at the time, later for Gluconobacter like we do for yeast and E. coli, you know, a curated collection of single gene knockout strains. Where you can test the ability of every 
gene to participate in a phenotype, be it making an acid or separating rare or binding and then separating rare earths. Or later, I'll tell you about uptaking electrons. So Michael Bame and I, Michael, uh, David and I know Michael. He's a uh, now he was a postdoc at Harvard Medical School, uh, now an assistant professor at, uh, at HMS. We came up with this technology called knockout Sudoku. And what this lets us do now, the, the reason we don't have knockout collections for weird bugs is that they are phenomenally expensive to make. So the Kyo collection and the yeast knockout collection each cost about three and a half million dollars and about four years of work and a team of postdocs and grad students to build. And when I was a postdoc, I realized, wait a second, I haven't got either of these things, uh, but I still want the knockout collection. So Michael and I, because otherwise I would go insane. So Michael and I decided, we knew that next generation sequencing can sequence thousands, tens of thousands of microbes for you know, the cost of $1,500 very very low cost so we figured if we could make an extremely large progenitor collection of microbes of transposon knockout mutants of shiwanella gluconobacter or really any weird bug we could then use next generation sequencing to figure out what those mutants all are that turns out to be quite a challenge in terms of statistical analysis but we were able to crack it we could figure out what they all are and then from that set of say 50,000 transposon knockout mutants, we could pick the best set, the best representative for each gene. So we take 40 or 50,000 transposon mutants up here, find the best uh, representative to knock out each gene, and then we condense it down to a collection of somewhere around three to 4,000 carefully chosen knockout mutants. So my postdoc, Alexa Schmitz, she was my first postdoc. Um, she used knockout Sudoku to figure out the genetics of bioleaching by Gluconobacter oxidans. So, so what she did, so she built the knockout collection and then she screened it for all the genes involved in acid production. And she came up with 165 genes that control the process. And out of that 165, two systems really stand out. The first one is phosphate signaling and transport. Gluconobacter does not eat rocks. Rare earths, rare earths come in uh, phosphate minerals like monazite and alanite. It does not eat those rocks to get rare earths, at least not to our knowledge. It gets them to have phosphate so it can make more DNA, so it can make more of itself. Wild type gluconobacter is, um, I guess it's like a Brit, it knows when to stop eating. But these mutants do not know when to stop eating. Just keep. You knock out the phosphate signaling and transport system, and it does not. And it has an uncontrollable appetite for eating sugar and making acid. And so, knocking that system out raises rare earth extraction. What I'm showing in this graph are some of our key strains that we selected for further analysis. And instead of measuring acid production, in the previous slide I used pH sensing dyes. Here, we're directly measuring rare earth release from a mineral. You find it, increase, it, direct, it increases rare earth extraction, bioleaching. On the other hand, if you knock out PQQ synthesis, PQQ is the cofactor that goes in the membrane-bound glucose dehydrogenase, the enzyme that makes gluconic acid that then attacks the rock. If you knock this out, you almost completely eliminate bioleaching. So what this did was it gave us a roadmap for engineering gluconobacter. Uh, so basically, PST normally puts the brakes on acid production. So our engine, our sort of suggested engineering approaches, take the brakes off, kill PST. Next, MGDH and the production of its cofactors, PQQ and also the TLD operon as well, which makes PQQ. Those accelerate acid production. You know, you have more of the enzyme that directly makes acid, and then you have more of the cofactor that goes in that enzyme. So just hit that accelerator harder. Um, what Alexa did first was she made a series of clean knockout strains of uh, gluconobacter. And what she found is if she knocks out, she does a surgical deletion 
of PSTS. This is, so PST stands for phosphate signaling and transport. The S means just the signaling domain, the signaling gene in that operon. What this does, if you knock this gene out, it doesn't interfere with the viability of the bug. It can uptake phosphate as much as it likes and it can replicate and stay as happy as it, happy, happy as it's ever going to be. If you, but if you knock out signaling, it doesn't know when to stop making acid. As a result, it, re, it lowers the pH of the biolixivient. This is the cocktail that dissolves rocks by almost 0.3 units. Next, what that does is it raises bioleaching from a rare earth alanite mineral uh, that comes from a new mine uh, in Arizona. Searchlight Arizona, by, that was given to us by a company called Western Rare Earths. It raises, raises bioleaching. Just this single gene intervention raises bioleaching by 30%. So that got us, you know, most of the way to our first milestone. Next. Oops, let's go back, sorry. Next, we combined that. So Alexa then screened a panel of mutants where we upregulate the membrane-bound glucose dehydrogenase. She found the best one was this one called P112. That again, you know, it just alone, um, if you combine that with Delta PSTS, it drops the pH by 0.39 units. What that means is you've raised bioleaching by over 50%. So we hit our first milestone here. So we, we hit, so that we set ourselves. Uh, next, and this is even better, this mutant, the PSTS plus upregulation of MGDH, is strangely amenable to process modification. So gluconobacter is a um, strict uh, aerobe. It really likes oxygen. So it's really amenable to process modification. So the wild type, you know, if you make those two gene knockouts and then you drop the pulp density, this is the ratio of liquid to solid in the bioleaching system from 10% down to 1%. The performance of the wild type doesn't change at all. But <laughs> But at 10% pulp density, you get a 53% improvement in bioleaching with this, with this double mutant that we've made. But if you drop the pulp density, you increase bioleaching by 73%. So that's well on our way to our second milestone of improving bioleaching by 90%. Uh, this success gave Alexa and Sean, uh, gave them the confidence to start a company called Regen. Uh, so Regen was, uh, was officially incorporated last year. Um, Alexa won a uh, fellowship from the Activate Foundation. Uh, this is a sort of nationwide US nonprofit that funds LabBench to tech startup transitions. Elan uh, uh, Gurr, who was the CEO when uh, Alexa took, uh, Alexa won this award. Uh, recently came to the UK to be the first CEO of, uh, of Aria. Uh, Sean, I'll tell you about his work in a second, uh, co-founded this company with Alexa. And so now Alexa is, uh, is based at an incubator on Cornell's campus and is taking the roadmap, you know, the next steps of the roadmap, all that genomic data we have on Gluconobacter to engineer Gluconobacter even more. Um, The next challenge we've got is separation of rare earth elements. And I'll also say, I'll give a plug. Uh, if you would like, I'm co very conscious of the time, but if you'd like to watch a video about Alexa, I'm happy to share that with you. This is a really fantastic plug for her work and, and regen. Uh, this leaves us with the second problem of separating rare earth elements. So just to, just to repeat this, that's a really, we, you know, rare earth. I didn't know this at the time when we started this, but we, I suspected rare earth extraction would be tough, and it was. I did not suspect that rare earth separation would be. I thought that would be tough as well, but I did not suspect how tough it would be. Um, we knew that she and Ella can selectively biosorb rare earths. What that means is it gives you, a, gives you the opportunity to separate them. But it, well, again, wasn't quite good enough for industrial use. 
So we hypothesized if we could figure out the genetics of biosorption, and almost nobody has done this for any organism, we can improve that selectivity, and hence we can improve the separation process. I want to give you a quick example of how we th and how we think this is going to work. And I want to stress we have yet done this beyond a piece of filter paper in a test tube in my lab. So imagine you've got a column and inside of it, there's a resin, a bio resin where you have immobilized microbes. Right now we immobilize Shewanella on a filter paper, but you can imagine encapsulating Shewanella in, uh, in gel beads, for instance. You flow in a, sol a mixed solution of rare earth elements. And, you, and, it's, and after equilibration, which only takes a few seconds, you'll get two phases here. You'll get the free phase in the liquid, and this is going to be depleted. Shewanella pre prefers middle rare earths in the middle of the lanthanide series. This is going to be depleted in the middle rare earths, and then this solid phase, the immobilized phase, is going to be enriched in middle rare earths. You can then wash out the free phase. You will have you will have gotten rid of the europium. Say europium is the most middle of middle rare earths. And then here the L, you can elute the rare earths from the bound phase with a light acid wash around pH three mo uh, at most. You could do it with Coca Cola or lemon juice. This is going to be enriched in europium. You then take this, you feed it back into the column and you repeat the process. And slowly, the concentration of europium, if our math is right, the concentration of europium in here is going to approach 99.9%. But we didn't understand, we, we said, if we can improve the selectivity of these microbes, we can reduce the length of this separation process to let it leapfrog conventional technologies. But we didn't understand enough about the genetics to make it happen. That's what I'm going to tell you about next. So Sean said, OK, I want to figure out I want to figure out biosorption. So you built this assay that uses a rare earth chelating dye called arsenal 3 We didn't we didn't invent this dye. Uh, but we've used it extensively in our work. So Arsenazo is a sort of a cyan color when it's unbound to rare earth, and it's a sort of mauve color when it's uh, bound to lanthanide. We take, here's a plate from the Shewanella knockout collection up here. What you'll see is there are some wells that are cyan and some that are sort of mauve purple colored. This one here has higher biosorption, the cyan one. And this one here, the really mauve one, has lower biosorption. So what this means is that this gene knockout normally promotes biosorption. And I've shown here two example plates from the knockout collection. Along here, along the x-axis, we've got the culture OD. So normally, and this was a, quite a challenge in data analysis when we were coming up with this, normally culture OD correlates stepwise linearly with biosorption. So you can fit this sloped line to most of the mutants. And you'll see we've colored them in blue. Anything that's within one standard deviation of this line, we color blue. But then there are some mutants here, and I've highlighted them in red that have low biosorption and green that have high biosorption. These are real outliers in this screen. These are the interesting ones. Next. Sean found about best part of 300 mutants, I think. 242 mutants he found. Now we know, I think all of us who've done classical genetics know when you do a screen, a genetic screen, a large fraction of the hits you get are difficult to reproduce. Typically about, I found in my experience, typically around half won't reproduce later. And I've seen this in all my postdocs, grad students when they've done these things. Sean's screen is a huge pain in the neck to do. And so he said, well, wait a sec. Yeah, it, what, this is the, one of the great things about sort of hiring people who are like trying to find ways to, you know, Bill Gates said, always hire a lazy 
lazy person because they'll find out a quicker way to do something. And Sean is obsessed with finding quicker ways to do things, which I love. So he said, okay, well, I could just retest all these things in triplicate, but this is going to take me six months. I would really like to graduate and start this company. So I'm going to see if I can figure out a way to shave out six months. So what he did was he said, well, okay, is there a computational way where we can rapidly narrow down which of these hits are likely to reproduce or not. And he came up with this enrichment analysis method. What this does is we look for G for hits that cluster together in, in operons or in pathways. And he highlighted six of these groups, uh, operons up here, polysaccharide synthesis, these first two, the mushe pillars, it looks like uh, rare earths localized papillus, pyrimidine synthesis, anaerobic redox control, uh, and then a bunch of miscellaneous genes that were just extremely strong signals. And what he found was, this was the great thing, the, if you were to pick a random sample of mutants from the screen, about 42% of them reproduce. Not, it's okay, not great. But Mutants chosen by this, oper this enrichment analysis method, they reproduce 80% of the time. So it's a really good way for triaging down mutants that are, gonna that are likely to reproduce, and it can save you a dramatic amount of work. Um, next, in this screen, Sean only looked at European binding, but he took his mutants, he, he took, he took, um, he took his subset that reproduced really well when you retest them with ICPMF, and he looked at their effect on selectivity, and he found nine genes, and then an additional two that have a really strong effect on biosorption. He found nine genes that also affect the selectivity as well. So for instance, I'll highlight this one. This one here, WBPA, which is part of the polysaccharide synthesis operon, which makes part of the lipopolysaccharide layer on the outer membrane of Shiwanella, where we think rare earths are biosorbing. If you, if you knock this out under uh, low ionic strength conditions, what you'll see is it improves the existing selectivity of Shiwanella for the middle lanthanide europium. So it makes it, gives it a higher, it enhances its existing preference. So what this means is we could take this mutant potentially, use it in a separation process, and it will separate out europium faster than the wild type. Now, you'll look at the magnitude of these changes and you'll say, oh, well, OK, sounds great, but this is 2%. Come on. Like, what? What are you talking about? Like, is this going to work at all? And we got that question from reviewers when we were. Well, but it turns out it does make a difference. And again, it's because the process is repeated. So that small change in selectivity compounds over multiple cycles. So if we want to get to 95% purity europium, which is sort of getting toward industrially useful, but not quite there. The wild type, you've got to do 19 cycles of biosorption and desorption to get to 95% purity. But our mutant, we think, if our maths is correct and our model is correct, will get us there in 15 steps. That's 21% reduction in process length. Next, if we want to get to 99.9% .9 purity, which is really industrially useful, the wild type would take 42 cycles. But the mutant, mutant we have right now in the lab, and we're testing this, could get there in 32. So that's almost a 30% decrease in process length from just a single gene modification. So as a result of this, what Sean's working on right now is combining these mutations that we've identified, and he's got a roadmap for how to do it. So, for instance, if, for instance, he want, we're going to randomly change the regulation of genes involved in selective rare earth binding. So, for instance, and he's trying to do this right now, to build a strain of Shiwanella with increased preference for europium over the wild type and over the WBPA mutant we already have. We're going to simultaneously down-regulate genes involved in lipopolysaccharide synthesis, including WBPA and WZZ, that's another gene in LPS synthesis, 
and at the same time downregulate genes involved in the mush a pillars assembly like mush b and mush j and together we think we can make a dramatic reduction in process length next and i know i've only got 10 minutes but i really want to share this part of my talk with you it's the electromicrobial production of, uh, of fu fuels foods and lixivians um, david knows this from my time at harvard medical school i i wanted to build this bug for well over a decade and i'm still trying but i think we've made a lot of progress in the past few years so i want to build this bug take solar electricity and co2 and then it directly uptakes electrons. It does this without a mediator or without a volatile mediator like hydrogen. And then it makes things like biofuels and it's got loads of potential benefits. These bugs like Shiwanella can make have very, very high Faraday efficiency. They don't waste electrons. We know we can turn sunlight to electricity with very high efficiency. Thanks to advances in solar PV. So potentially you could combine solar PV in this bug and then make chemicals very, very efficiently. There's no volatile intermediate, no hydrogen. Uh, so it could be very, very cheap to manufacture and operate. But it's got multiple problems with this vision. And I think my time at HMS, we, especially Zev Wax, who was a grad student at the time, really articulated what these challenges are. First, coming back to the weird bug problem. I don't think, in fact, I said very few, but I don't think there are any microbes out there that can directly uptake electrons, fix CO2, and are highly genetically engineerable. You get two of those things at best. You get engineerability and fixing CO2, or you get electron uptake engineerability, or you get six CO2 and uptake electron, but they, you know, they're terrible to engineer. You never get all three. What this means is we're gonna have to make this microbe by synthetic biology. Then there's this third problem. The electrons that are coming into the bug need to be delivered at about zero volts redox potential versus the standard hydrogen electrode. But NADH, the reductant used in carbon fixation, is at negative 320 millivolts. This is much higher, much more negative, so much higher energy. So Lita Bird, who was a grad student at Harvard Med School at MIT at the time, figured out, really put her finger on it, some sort of voltage conversion is necessary here. Then there's the next problem. We knew that electrons could get into Shiwanella. It could uptake them without exploding, but it wasn't clear they could be used to regenerate NADH and ATP, the two essential things for carbon fixation and synthesis of fuels. And then finally, it wasn't clear that if you put the genes for CO2 fixation as a result of that, right, as a result of the fact that it wasn't clear that you could regenerate NADH and ATP, it wasn't clear that if you put the genes for CO2 fixation into Shiwanella, they would work because you wouldn't have any power for them. Next, you know, if you if you were to take those genes for the known genes for electron outflow, the MTR system from Shiwanella, metal reduction system, and then put them in E. coli or Vibrio nitrogens or Gluconobacter, could they fix CO2 with them? Or is there some extra piece of machinery that you need for electron uptake? And then finally, um, I got this question in a job talk at Penn State, you know, OK, say you do all this. Given that there is this need to up convert the energy of the electrons. What would the efficiency of this system be? I didn't have a good answer to that question at the time. I, I didn't get the job, perhaps understandably. Um, and then finally, thanks to work, you know, in Pam Silver's lab by Chong Lu and, and Dan Nocera, there's the bionic leaf where the bug uptakes electrons through hydrogen. It's crazy efficient. Isn't this good enough? So, you know, could we just declare victory? So, so given all of this, I asked myself the question, you know, was it worth spending all my life doing this? Uh, and that was a serious, serious, seriously kept me up at night. But that's, that's, you know, that's just me. The next question is, is it worth spending the taxpayers money on? That's really serious. 
And, you know, in some ways that would stop you spending your life on it if you couldn't get it. And then most importantly at all, was it worth asking a grad student or a postdoc to burn the career or making this a reality if it was never going to work? I think that's a really important point. And, and I realized a few years back, wait a sec, we really need to, we really need to try and answer this question. And I realized at the time, solar photovoltaics have faced the is it worth it question too. So in the late 50s, solar PV could convert sunlight to electricity with only a few percent efficiency. Shockley and Quasar, uh, Shockley won the Nobel Prize for the transistor, laid out a theory for the efficiency of PV, and they told people what would happen if they followed their roadmap. This paper appeared in the Journal of Applied Physics in 1961, and it predicted accurately the upper limit efficiency of solar PV. What this means is, I think as a result of this theory, gave people confidence that if they put effort into this tech, it would pay off. And as a result, PV is on an exponential cost reduction curve. It's almost at its ultimate efficiency, and I think it's poised to power the planet. So here's the cost reduction. Oh, here and here's the efficiency going up and up and up. So I said we really need a shock liquidator limit. We need a theory that predicts the upper limit efficiency of bugs that eat electricity. And I know that I'm running short on time here. So needless to say, I scratched my head about this for years, but we came up with something to do it. And we were able to predict the upper limit efficiency of these bugs. And I won't, I won't. I won't belabor the math, but the answer, and I'm just going to skip right to the answer, in fact. The answer is, it works. Here it is. So this is the efficiency of a, of a as yet unbuilt microbe, the predicted efficiency, that uptakes electrons directly through a process called extracellular electron uptake. We predict this bar here, is the efficiency, the measured upper limit efficiency of the bionic leaf. That's the device that uptakes electrons by oxidizing hydrogen and makes the biofuel isopropanol. This is its upper end of its efficiency. A bug that I never expected this to be true, but theoretically at least, a bug that uptakes electrons directly can have better efficiency than the bionic leaf. Now, wait a second. You say, okay, that's the measured efficiency. This is the upper limit. We went and then and calculated the upper limit efficiency of hydrogen. Just a little bit higher by a couple of percent. So if we can make this, we can do away with the volatile unsafe intermediate here and only pay a tiny penalty in efficiency. In all of these cases as well, these efficiencies are dramatically higher than even the, the upper limit efficiencies of photosynthesis. So what this tells me is this is really, really worth going after. So then the next question is, how do we build that bug that directly uptakes electrons? And again, this is why we came up with knockout Sudoku to go after that question. So we built a knockout collection for Shiwanella. We knocked out every non-essential gene in its genome and we screened it with this dye called AQDS. This was well established at the time, but we reversed it. So we gave the bug a reduced form of the dye. And this thankfully has a redox potential around zero volts. So exa an exact, at least energetically, an exact analog of an electrode poised to power the bug. And then we screened the knockout collection uh, with it. So the bug, at least the wild type, uptakes electrons and then it puts electrons back on the die. We built this device, Michael and I built this device called the macroscope. And I think this was, this one was actually in the Wies Institute. This was our prototype. We later made a much fancier one. And we powered it with a foot pedal actually. So you could, you could screen hundreds of plates in just a few minutes. Um, and then you put this plate holder on the high, uh, to hold high throughput plates. We had a computer controlled camera to image every plate. Um, here's a fancier version of the system in my lab at Princeton. Uh, this is Isao, this is Kemi, uh, and this, this is me back then. 
Uh, and we were able to screen the knockout collection and build time courses for every mutant. We, out of this, we got about 160 genes that we could re that robustly knocked out electron uptake. So we said, okay, really we need to test these on an electrode. And we found five genes that encode this completely novel electron uptake pathway. This now gives us, here's a, here's a diagram of it, a schematic diagram of how we think the mechanism works. This now gives us a roadmap for taking this system, the electron uptake system, combining it with the well-known extracellular electron transfer system from Schuenel, and putting it in a highly engineerable bug like Vibrio nitrogens or E. coli. I'm going to leave you with two final thoughts. If we can make this bug, and I'm confident now that we can, we know it's worth doing, and we know genetically how to do it, it'll allow us to th build things like food, amino acids, with only a tenth the energy input of farming. It'll allow us to make lixivians so that we can get that magnesium. You know, I talked about increasing magnesium supply by 6,000 fold. It'll let us make lixivians and it'll let us make them cheaply enough that we can sequester a ton of CO2 for less than $100. And then finally, we can make potentially make jet fuels that are cost competitive with conventional fossil derived jet fuels. With solar PV, even at prices that will hit by 2030. And with that, I'm going to leave you with a few final thoughts. So we've now got roadmaps for engineering rare earth bio leaching and selective biosorption. Uh, We've even started a company called Regen to do this, uh, and you'll hear more, I hope, from Regen. Uh, I never, never like to, I, I, I never, ever like to, I'm, I'm never like to be negative about other people's work. So if I were the CEO of ExxonMobil, I would start making jet fuel with hydrogen oxidizing bugs today, but I would also start making a bug that can directly uptake electrons as well to make jet fuels even better. Um, we think that you can convert electricity and CO2 to biofuels, food, and lixivians with efficiencies around 40%. And this could enable ultra large scale CO2 capture. And we've got all the genetic information that we need to get started on this. So thank you.